Hello, everyone, and welcome to 360 Feedback, Best Practices to Fuel Success. I'm going to give everyone a minute to get signed in. While we're waiting to get started, I'll take care of a few housekeeping items and introductions. I'm Jesse Beringer, Head of Marketing for 3D Group, and I'll be facilitating our session today. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat function throughout the presentation. We'll be answering as many of your questions as we can at the end in a Q&A session. Joining me to discuss 360 Feedback Best Practice is 3D Group President, Dr. Dale Rose. Dr. Rose is the founder of 3D Group and a nationally recognized expert on talent assessment, leadership development, and 360 feedback. Dr. Rose is a widely published author in academic journals and an author and co-editor of the recently released Handbook of Strategic 360 Feedback. In addition to designing custom 360 feedback systems for clients, Dr. Rose personally coaches leaders in focus post 360 feedback sessions. While he most frequently works at the executive and C-suite level, he's supported leaders at every level from board chair to first line supervisor. He's also a frequent contributor to publications such as the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, CEO World, and HR.com. Now I'll hand it over to you, Dale, to get us started. Thanks, Jesse, and thank you all for joining me today for one of my favorite topics, 360 feedback and sort of how do we do it better, if you will. Uh, I'll be sharing today uh, a number of different data points that support sort of what best practices are grounded in uh, some benchmarking that we've done of, of current practices across the, the industry. Uh, and so I'll be able to share sort of what, you know, what, um, what companies typically do and then give, I'm going to, I'm going to leave you with six key kind of top best practices, uh, and then we'll make sure there's uh, time for questions. Now, what I find is that often um, executive, particularly HR uh, executives, are asked and challenged on this core question of, um, you know, but what's the bottom line? Does it help the business? So I, I'm going to sort of start with the end in mind, if you will. Um, we know from having done the work that when you help leaders to be more effective in the way they're leading the organization, leading the people that are working with them and for them um, and to, for whom they're working with, uh, working for, if you will, uh, the, the, the organization is going to thrive, right? Better leadership leads to better organizational outcomes. We do have some data to, to illustrate some of these things. So um, we actually did a study, this is a 3D group um, study that was done a number of years ago where we looked at a group of, of 65 um, leaders in a retail setting. So these are store managers in a retail setting. And um, we took all 65 that had participated in this particular program, and we just split the data right down the middle and said, all right, let's look at the high scores and the low scores. So you can see here um, the high scores here and the low scores here. What we did is we looked at their average uh, store revenue on an annual basis. And you can see that the, the high scores are about $5 million a year more. And these are actually score uh, uh, revenue that's sort of adjusted for uh, things like how long has the store been you know, in place? It wasn't like the, all the low scores were just brand new stores. Also adjusted for uh, income in, the, in, their, um, in their respective areas. So we've seen sort of that raw outcome that, that generally if you help people on these behaviors, you're going to end up with, with better outcomes. Uh, there's also been uh, relatively recently a study done in a top journal in our field, the Journal of Applied Psychology, where um, uh, Kim and, and his colleagues did uh, looked at 253 companies. These are actually companies in um, uh, South Korea and looked really closely at each of them to determine to what do, if, they're, if they are if they are doing 360 feedback, uh, you know, what, how are they doing it? And then how is it predictive of worker productivity as they defined it there? And they found a very strong positive correlation um, with using 360 feedback and, and, and workforce productivity. So again, just that, that focus on being more effective, more effective behaviors in the workplace are going to end up, end up translating. Um, we also, in our benchmark study, so we, we, we did a benchmark study that was recently released, over 600 companies included in 20 years of data. So this is actually the seventh edition. So that's covering the, the whole 20 year span. We asked 22 kind of key design questions like, you know, how, how long is your survey? How often do you use the process? Things along those lines. And I'll be touching on this all throughout the day here. Um, when we asked 
uh, HR leaders that are using 360 feedback, what is the value? What is the impact? We gave them a few options. And really what stood out was this notion of retaining high potentials and helping leaders make better decisions. Those are the kind of key things that they saw where the where they saw 360s making a, a difference. And I think, in, I mean, I think both of these uh, resonate with the work that I've done and the work that I've uh, seen done, uh, but particularly the better decision making, the idea that um, in a 360, you're uncovering sort of hidden information that is going to help a leader understand what's going on in their environment in ways they might not otherwise have, have understood. Now, one of the reasons for this, if we think about kind of what typical workplace behavior is, if I'm a, if I'm a leader and what I'm, you know, typically, where am I going to get most of my feedback about how well am I doing on my job? Well, my direct manager is the most likely candidate to be giving me feedback on, am I doing the things that I should be doing or am I not doing the things I should be doing? So in effect, most people are left with sort of a, a single source bias, right? There's a one individual, you're going to get one individual and that person is going to give you all the feedback that you in theory need. Well, the trick with that is that it's a little bit of a lottery. Not a lot of people get to choose their manager. So you end up with this sort of a, a, a Sophie's choice, if you will, of, well, who would you like feedback from? So, you know, do I want to, do I want to hear from this guy here? You know, he, he doesn't seem to be having such a good day. This person here, maybe not so trusting, and I don't know what's going on with this guy. Somehow I feel like there's a wad of cash somewhere in his pocket. Um, but this person up here, boy, that's the manager I want to talk with because this is someone who's probably going to be real interested in my um, development um, and going to give me open, honest feedback. So, you know, the challenge is that one person, it's really just up to like, did you happen to get a manager that, you know, is, is, is the one on the upper left here? Uh, a different approach to workplace feedback, of course, is 360 feedback, where it might look something more like this. So instead of just this one supervisor, now I'm also going to hear from my peers. Now, not all of them, as you can see, are happy, right? This guy seems a little bit less happy. These guys are pretty neutral. Um, but in the aggregate, I'm going to understand, well, how do my peers see me? And that's a very, maybe very different from the way the aggregate of this peer group uh, uh, sees me. So again, you know, I've got confused guy here. I've got happy, just started my job guy. Um, you know, I've got, yeah, maybe you, you could you could put all kinds of, you know, projections on this guy. This guy over here, I'm really concerned about. Um, he seems like not such a good one. But by being able to look at each one of these different groups and how they see me differently, now I can understand where I'm being effective and where I'm being less effective. Um, additionally, by understanding not just the, the overall average, say, of this other group and seeing a spread of scores, I also might be able to understand, oh, there is an outlier here. Um, but really, the, you know, three of these four seem pretty, pretty happy with many of the behaviors I'm exhibiting. So being able to take, you know, 360 feedback takes what otherwise is a pretty narrow perspective on your performance and really un unpacks it in ways that allow you to then plan and and, and make, make better decisions about how you can develop as a leader. So this is fundamentally what 360 feedback is doing. Now, I do like to throw out uh, our sort of definition of 360 feedback because we've seen a lot of applications of 360 that really don't quite fit the bill. Um, and it's important to think about a standard or a common way of, of looking at what really is 360 feedback. The most common um, perspective there or, or um, uh, misnomer, I would say, is the notion of 360 feedback interviews, um, which are purely qualitative. There's no you know, confidentiality at all. The interviewer knows exactly who they're talking to. And there doesn't tend to be a full coverage of all the behaviors. So we really define 360 feedback uh, as have three main components. And this is kind of grounded in some of the work that uh, my colleagues and I have done um, and written about. Um, the first point is it is a quantitative survey. And the quantitative survey gives you the opportunity to, to on an apples to apples basis, compare each of those groups on the same exact behaviors. So each of those groups uh, might give you feedback on something like listens to others attentively. And so I can clearly see that my peer group feels I don't listen as well as say my direct reports do or vice versa. If you're doing a qualitative interview, that all tends to get mushed up together and you can't really see what that, that um, 
difference is. Now, it's not that those interviews aren't valuable. I think we often use those in our own practice, but we add them to a 360 pro process. So um, no hate on the interviews, but just let's differentiate and be mindful that, that a quantitative 360 feedback process is gonna get you some things that interviews won't. The other key is um, relevant workplace behavior. So you want, this is not personality, this is not, um, you know, sort of abstract behaviors. I actually know of a commercial instrument out there, for example, that literally asks the question, um, if Dale was a dog, what kind of dog would he be? And then lists out 20 breeds, completely bonkers. I will not name that source. Um, and then also the idea that there are multiple sources, right? So you've got each of those different groups. So you put these three things together and you're gonna get a good solid 360 feedback process. And just to be clear, that is the process or type of process we're looking at. And when, when I say this, it, it, let me give you a little bit more detail about what it looks like. So um, your survey is gonna look like this. You're gonna have, you know, say five ratings, one, you know, considerable development needed, some development needed, meets expectations, strength, exceptional. Always recommend that you include a don't know, not applicable. Occasionally there are behaviors in there people haven't seen or aren't sure of. Better for them to opt out than to add noise into your data points. So you're going to ask all those raters that we saw on the slide before to fill out a survey with these ratings. And then you're going to, um, you're going to, they're going to get a result that typically will display the averages for each rater group. So you can see, as we see here, the direct report data are quite different, say, than the other data. So maybe I have something to look at in terms of how I'm listening to that particular group. Um, so again, super helpful from a developmental perspective to have that quantitative data. Now, who uses 360 feedback? Um, if you think about kind of a boilerplate, you know, org structure, kind of the different levels, executive, um, manager level, individual contributor level. When we look at our survey data, our benchmark data, we find that that really uh, it's about, you know, about half of companies are using using uh, 360 with their executives. Um, interestingly, more are using it at kind of that director managerial level, but less so on the individual contributor level. Um, there's an investment involved, uh, so maybe not too surprising, uh, but you do see it used at all different levels of the organization. Of course, the content will vary, right? An individual contributor is not going to be asked questions around delegation, for example, um, or setting high expectations, but they probably would be asked questions about listening to others attentively or following through in commitments, which you would expect to see at all three of these levels. So we do see 360s used at multiple levels within the organization. Now, how is it that, that a survey like that is gonna get you, uh, get you insights? How is it gonna get you to be able to understand where you need to change your behavior and develop and grow? Um, the, simple, the simple answer is, it. 360 feedback gives you self-awareness, right? That's the whole premise. Super important that you fill out your own survey, right? You fill out your own survey, others fill out a survey, and then you can sit there and say, wow, I thought I was really great at listening to others, but apparently I'm not with my direct reports, but I am with that other group. So I'm kind of on, but you know, I, I, I'm, I'm now more aware of what's going on. And the key here is to recognize that um, it, it is in the eyes of the beholder, right? Um, so for example, um, let's take a look at this apple. So imagine for a moment you're using a five point rating scale on, you know, does this apple need, need a lot of development or is it just perfect the way it is? So make your rating in your mind um, and recognize that you're seeing this apple, you know, from your point of view, your perspective, your, you know, maybe you had an apple this morning that looked just like this. Maybe you don't like apples, all kinds of different angles. Um, but also your experience with this apple may be limited to the angle that you have on the apple. So if we were to rotate that apple for you and ask you now to rate it, you might see something different. So the idea here is that you're helping people be aware of themselves from multiple different perspectives. That direct report in our prior example, that direct report perspective was very different than the other perspective. The other perspective saw a nice shiny apple when it came to listening. Lovely, perfect, nothing better. Direct reports, maybe not quite this bad, but saw opportunities. So again, being able to differentiate, but being aware of where is it that I'm being more effective? Where could I be less effective? Um, of course, the interesting thing is that awareness isn't always enough. 
uh, you know, undoubtedly this leader is aware that she has perhaps to uh, an opportunity to delegate and is holding on to more things than one might be able to do themselves. So just making her aware of that is not necessarily enough. You also have to add in a component of acceptance for a need to change, right? So, oh yeah, yeah, there it is. But uh, okay, am I really gonna accept that I need to change? This is not working the way I want it to. Uh, the circumstance is not, not as effective as I want. So the way we think about that model, uh, we, the, the model we've created to think about this dynamic is that fundamentally what you're trying to do in with a 360 tool is to change someone's behavior. Uh, if anything, help them to change their behavior. So the first step is you need to get them aware, but then you also have to let them create a plan that will lead to behavior change. The gaps that, that move you forward through this process have to do with both acceptance and accountability. So fundamentally, when you look at your 360 process, and we'll look at some elements of a design in a moment, you want to be thinking about how, what am I doing in my process to help people accept that this feedback is, is, is worth acting on and creating a plan? And then what mechanisms within my program create accountability for that change? So those components, you really want to tie into each one of these different elements. How am I helping people be aware? Uh, what am I doing to support their acceptance of the feedback? How am I helping them plan? And then what kind of accountability is there? So for example, accountability could be simply, you must meet with your manager and talk with them about what you learned and what you're gonna do differently. Um, acceptance could involve providing a coach or an interpretation guide or something along those lines to help somebody understand and orient themselves well to the feedback. So fundamentally, you wanna just tie your different components in there. And what you'll find as you're starting to design a process is there are lots of questions as you're starting to fill in those gaps that emerge. So when you get started uh, on kind of designing your process, you're going to think, well, who should participate? Uh, but then pretty soon, other questions are going to start popping up. Um, and it does get pretty complicated pretty fast. Uh, all of these different design questions are things that actually need to be addressed. Um, and I think uh, it's super helpful to have a framework like that, the, 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 our change model, to be thinking about how you answer these things. Who owns a report? Well, how does that decision, uh, is, is that decision going to be affected by the, the, the way that we're, by, how is that decision going to affect someone's acceptance of the feedback? If, extreme example, that report is just put up in the break room, is that going to help them be more open to their feedback or is it going to make them defensive? If it's only their report, no one else gets to see it. Is that going to make them more open, more accepting of the feedback? Probably. But then what about accountability? So playing off each of these decisions within that model is a, a really effective way to think about designing your particular program. We actually boil it down to kind of three big buckets that you want to that you want to think about from a design standpoint in addressing these. So if you're trying to get to behavior change, there are kind of three prerequisites you need to address. Um, first is relevant content. So my example of the, you know, what kind of breed would I be? Not relevant at all. So what you want are really clear, actionable behaviors that are relevant to their role. So putting aside the silly or horrible example I gave of the dog breed, even something like, you know, does this person delegate effectively if you're giving an individual contributor that survey? It's not going to work out so well, right? It needs to be relevant. If you're asking, um, uh, you know, a uh, an individual contributor how they're designing strategy, it's not going to be relevant. So it needs to be relevant and translatable, but it also needs to be actionable. A lot of times we see items built that are incredibly long and complicated and it takes a long time to rate, and then it takes a long time to understand. So much clearer defined you know, items, follows through in commitments, um, uh, uh, admits mistakes, listens to others attentively, clear behaviors. That's what you're really looking for. Um, secondly, the data have to be credible, right? So um, we did a process one time, one of the very first processes we did almost 30 years ago, 
where the, the employer decided that they weren't going to even tell people that they were participating in the process. They were simply going to collect a bunch of data about them and then give them the report. And that report just contained the number of peers, direct reports, and, the, and their manager that were included, but no names. So they had no idea who filled the survey out. They didn't even know they were participating. It was a great excuse just to say, well, I don't know who was participating. Why would I pay attention to this? Somebody thinks this about me. Um, so, you know, picking the right raters is super important, um, but also anonymity um, is, a, is a central component where you want to make sure that that, that, that aspect is, is highlighted because um, people have a tendency not to share face to face what they're really thinking. But if you give them an anonymous survey, an opportunity to really provide a rating where they won't be identified, then they're going to give you the, the, the straight scoop, so to speak. Um, and then lastly is that accountability component I talked about. We tend to emphasize manager involvement as a key component, making sure that manager is involved. That doesn't that can mean that they get a copy of the report. They get a copy of a of a shorter report that is um, you know doesn't contain say all the comments, um, but uh, some or it could just be they they get you know a, a conversation about here's what I learned from the from the survey. But some kind of manager involvement tends to be a pretty pretty good lever. And then feedback coaching is one of the more effective effective ways of building an accountability. So again, you know thinking about uh, these different components when you're designing your process. What, how is this process going to, going to um, really inform or support behavior change? Okay, so enough of my big frameworks. Let's take a look at some data and some, some of those best practices. So um, within what I've just described, uh, one of the, probably the top thing to think about from a best practice standpoint, um, and you'll see it from the, in, in the data as well, is to be clear about the purpose. Why are we doing this? What are we hoping to achieve? What is the purpose? And you want to, that will affect your design, but it's also going to affect the way uh, you message and communicate. So if being clear about the purpose is that key, that you know, key variable, it's worth knowing what other companies do. So again, back to our benchmark results here. Um, you can see these top two are pretty clear standouts. Uh, you know, development, career development specifically, tend to be kind of the, the, the anchors. Um, this is a yes and, so it could be multiple things. It could be for career development, but also for succession planning, for example, or high potential identification. Um, but clearly the predominant uh, theme here is that the purpose is around development. Um, there's also a training needs aspect that shows up quite a bit, linking to where do we need, you know, this is a great system-wide perspective. Where do we need to build training, but then also at the individual level, what training might this individual pursue? Sort of a development-oriented one. You can see when we get down here to succession planning at 21% of companies and down below, those tend to be more of the kind of um, performance managey kinds of things uh, relating to performance, promotion, and whatnot. And so there tends to be less of a usage there, but still 20, 21% of companies is not, not, not trivial. So we do see that there are quite a few ways in which while the tool will be developmental, it also can be used to inform some decision making that is beyond the decisions about what what uh, one might develop and what um, developmental resources might be available, uh, particularly again succession um, uh, planning I think, and then within that high potential uh, we we see pretty frequently used. So be clear about the purpose, be clear in your design, but also be clear in your communications. Right? If you if you're designing it for development. But then you communicate that you're going to use it to determine pay increases. You're going to get a different result. So um, make sure there's alignment there and make sure that that message is loud and clear. One thing that's interesting about 360s, they do tend to get a reputation in an organization for the way they're used. So you want to be clear and vocal about the way you intend to use it and then follow through on that. Um, you also you know, want to, as you're doing that, consider that big picture. Um, what is the you know, what is the strategy? How is this process going to support our business strategy? Um, I talked a lot about the communication piece. Um, but, you know, also, are you looking primarily at individual data? Or are you looking at organizational data? We worked with we worked with one organization, for example, that assessed all their commercial leaders in an effort to see, can we shift the way that we're doing sales 
Um, do we have the skill sets? Are our leaders ready to move in that direction? Um, it wasn't until we pointed it out that that occurred to them, oh, maybe we should give the individual leaders their actual report. They were really trying to assess talent across the entire department. So um, making sure that you're kind of your, what's your, your focal point uh, is another way to think about purpose and, and drive some of your decisions around design. Uh, the second factor that we've seen to be really impactful, um, and, and this is true, I think, of any intervention or any, any uh, initiative within an organization, um, but it's particularly true for 360 feedback, is the importance of senior level support. So senior level support uh, shows up in a lot of different ways. Uh, indeed, even to the point of writing content. Um, we worked with a Fortune 50 company to do 360s across their entire uh, organization where literally their CEO was involved in writing items, uh, editing report formats. Um, you know, he was very invested in this. This is how I'm going to message across the organization, the behaviors I need to see in my leaders and I want my, hand, my fingerprints on it. Um, far more effective than trying to just put out a video that says, hey, we should all be innovative. It's, hey, how about we translate what innovative means into behaviors and then let people get feedback on it all the way down through the organization. Much more effective. So um, while it's great to get senior level support and you know um, encouragement from senior level uh, leaders for any initiative, for 360, because it's so grounded in leadership and leadership development, it seems to be particularly important. So here's some data we found on how much senior level support typically there is for a 360 process. That's a lot of numbers. So um, the way this is set up is, you know, did they say they were a strong advocate or supportive, neutral, or unsupportive? Clearly, we're seeing a lot of strong advocacy, but also just supportive. When we put those together, we see that CHROs, I suppose not surprisingly, are the most supportive in that sort of C-suite. But really, even, um, you know, even the CEO the CLO, again, one would expect, but even 78% of CEOs being supportive of a 360 process illustrates, again, some of those slides I was showing at the beginning. The CEOs don't tend to invest in things that don't get a return. So there's a lot of support, partially because they see how it works. They understand that the way you impact and influence your the leaders and people around you is how leaders are effective. We weren't super surprised to see that CFOs were somewhat less uh, supportive. Um, maybe that's just their scrutiny uh, and whatnot, but it also could be that not all CEO, CFOs are, are focused on what, what often are called sort of the soft skills of leadership. Maybe they're looking a little more for quantitative results. And then frontline leaders, where we see them, uh, uh, you know, again, being the, the, the lowest level of support, um, but still a pretty strong, strong um uh, support for the process. So I think thinking about these different groups and recognizing that generally speaking, you're going to get support at that top level, but I highly recommend you engage at that level and, and try to get that support and involvement even in the design, make sure their needs are being met and that they're being involved even so far as to the content, at least at the, at the competency level. I don't really recommend sitting with the CEO to write items. That's not necessarily going to result in clear focused behaviors. It's likely to end up in very complex uh, convoluted items that are hard to understand. So I, I, from a survey writing standpoint, maybe not so much. Um, all right, uh, content though is really important. Uh, so I think as I've talked about, you can, you can think about using content to drive culture, right? If, if I love this definition of culture, um, you know, that, that, that getting, you get the behaviors that you exhibit and tolerate, right? You, you leaders, and, and this is a way, 360 feedback is a way to uh, communicate to the organization what behaviors are expected uh, and then to hold people accountable for it. So I think uh, super important to think about that survey content you don't really want, ideally, I mean, there's some great off-the-shelf tools. Don't get me wrong. They can be very, very helpful. They will drive culture to some degree. But if you're doing a, a project at enough scale, uh, you're going to end up in a, in a 
space where you're customizing content. And if you're in that space, you really do want to just think about what does this message say about our culture and what we're trying to drive, which again is part of where your CEO is going to be interested. So just to give an example, you know, there are two different types of survey questions that you could use that are going to drive a very different message down through the organization. These are actually items that we have used. And the first one is sort of maybe, you know, it's not bad. It's, you know, you're looking to process improve, um, but it's a little bit more passive and less aspirational than the second one. Uh, the second one actually produced quite a few conversations in the group that we were using this with uh, because it, it, it caused a lot of questions about, well, what could I possibly do to make transformational changes, which is exactly what the CEO in this particular company wanted people talking about and looking about and looking for. And so it, it prompted conversations in ways, just simply putting it on the survey that were really constructive. And again, created a lot of alignment up and down through the organization around a behavior that was very important for what that CEO was trying to achieve in kind of a turnaround scenario. So think about the content in that kind of culture and strategy and again, uh, messaging uh, senior leadership um, uh, values and, and, and the cult desired culture to achieve the strategy that they've laid out. Um, our book on on strategic 360 feedback kind of kind of hits this point pretty hard uh, because I think it is so important. Uh, while we're on content, uh, the other one that often comes up, particularly um, you know uh, of late, uh, surveys are um, well a lot of surveys out there, right? We all fill out probably hundreds of surveys a year, um, uh, so we often get asked the question well, gee, how long should the survey be? My CEO wants it to be 10 questions, but I'm not sure that's enough to cover all the behaviors a leader needs. Um, short and easy is not always the answer. Uh, you really, leadership's complicated. Uh, the behaviors are nuanced. So you can make it quick and easy, but you're not gonna maybe get it as in depth as is needed to help a leader really get guidance and understand how, they're, how, they're, how impactful they're being. Uh, so our best practice, what we're gonna what we're gonna um, sort of stand on, is the notion that seventy five questions or less is the is the ideal. Um, maybe even ten years ago, there were surveys out there frequently in the one hundred and twenty range. A lot of questions. That's you, you got to be able to cover it in more than that. But anytime you're under, you know, certainly thirty, under thirty is just it's really gonna not feel to a leader like a comprehensive view of their leadership, it's going to feel a little bit more like a report card, like good or bad. You get 70 questions on 10 different competencies that are in depth um, with specificity for multiple raters. Now you can dig in and really understand where you're being effective and, and where you're being less effective. So our data show in the benchmark study in terms of what companies typically do, a, a pretty big range, as you might expect. So certainly there are some, a little less than 10% that are just real small, I would call it kind of quick and dirty, um, getting a high level view. Uh, even these, the 20 to 40, you know, are 21 to 40, you know, that's a pretty short survey. 40, you could probably pull off. Again, individual contributor, for example, a little simpler job, absolutely. But this 41 to 60 and then 61 and up, this is where you're really, now you're able to get enough kind of reliability in your ratings as well to, to, to really understand what's going on for a leader. If you write them well, these can be done very quickly. Um, we've got 70 item surveys that we time and they can be done in six minutes. Um, now, open-ended comments, someone can write forever. Um, we've got one client that literally raters will write a page and a half. But that's on them. That's up to them. They could write a real short sentence, or they could write a whole page, um, and that's that's on them. Uh, so if you're writing your your questions well, uh, clear, behavioral, actionable, uh, people get in a pretty good response set. One to five, I can rate. You know, listens attentively, follows certain commitments, uh, admits mistakes. I can rate those pretty quickly, and you'd be surprised at how little time it takes. Um, there are some tricks, of course, that you can do to make it easier for people. You don't want to give them two days to fill out surveys. You want to give them two weeks to fill out surveys. You want to send them some reminders. Um, let them save as they go and come back anytime. Uh, that kind of thing. But when it comes to length, we're gonna we're gonna stand on seventy five or less as the number. 
Uh, all right, number five of our items, probably in some ways the most important, um, certainly that's what the, our, our um, uh, benchmark participants have said, anonymity, right? The, the anonymity is kind of the heart, if you will, of 360 feedback. Uh, people, if people were good at just walking up to their manager and saying, man, you are just such a micromanager. Could you get off my back and let me go do my job? Or maybe a more toned down version of that, then you wouldn't really need this process. And in a perfect world, that's what they would do. But think back to our list of managers. Which of those managers is going to hear that message right? Maybe one out of four? I don't know. Um, but it's not a lot. So the anonymity bit is really important here as our respondents agreed that, that anonymity was actually just an essential component. That if you indicated on reports who said what, um, real problem, because no one's, again, back to that credible data, no one's going to believe the data. They're going to be like, yeah, yeah, this is not, you know, uh, this isn't right. But if you promise anonymity, then they're like, okay, they could have said anything here. And they actually gave me fives on all of it. So probably they believe I'm doing really well. Hmm. Good to know. Didn't know that, right? We see that a lot with leaders. Usually people think it's, you know, oh, I'm getting, you know, bad scores. No, it's a lot of times it's recognizing that you're being more effective than you realize with a particular group. So how do you get anonymity? Um, well, one thing is um, you don't have your own IT department run through the data because they can look at anything they want. Um, there is no anonymity. You use a third party. Uh, probably the strongest mechanism for anonymity, particularly in the way it's reported out, is to control the number of raters who are, um, uh, as a minimum, required in order to report data separately. So if you think back to the report that I showed before, where you saw an average score for peers and direct reports, if there's only one peer in there, no anonymity, right? So you can't really report that score. If there's two, mm, it's close, but not really. It still feels a little bit too tight. So typically what we see is that three, if you get at least three peers responding, then you go ahead and report that average score. And it's hard to know, did somebody give me a three and somebody gave me a five and somebody gave me a one, or was it, you know, all threes? I don't know. Um, so in that context, we, that's exactly what we find in the industry, frankly. And we've seen this again and again. If you look back over the 20 years, the, the, the modal response consistently is around um, three raters being minimum to report out those data separately. So uh, it's a standard. We do see it go higher. Um, but the trick is if you're using four raters, there's one company that uses six. I think um, the, the challenge there is that you really uh, end up not getting enough data to people. So three ends up being kind of that minimum number that's adequate to protect anonymity but also you know, make sure that you get the most number of leaders. Occasionally you'll run into a leader that only has two direct reports. Um, and I get, we get that question all the time. And sadly, the answer is, if you only have two direct reports, you can't really give you anonymous feedback. It's not gonna, you know, people are gonna pretty much know. And that's critical for this process. So unfortunately, if you've only got two direct reports, probably this process won't work. Unless you take those two and combine them, say with peers and just look at an overall, You'll miss the differences of rater groups, but at least you will get an overall view of what things look like. That can be valuable. So, uh, but we don't don't typically recommend that, and we definitely don't recommend going with no minimum because again, just the the loss of anonymity is a problem. All right, last best practice that we see, and I, I you know I, I probably could do twenty, but we have limited time. I picked my top six. Um, is coaching. Um, some sort of follow-up support. This is not, I'm talking six months of executive coaching. I'm talking, you know, a one, one hour, one-on-one -on -one feedback coaching. Uh, and we found that, you know, predominantly the people doing this process expect that that's a critical element of the process. Now it doesn't need to say, it doesn't need to be that you have to get coaching, but at minimum, they're saying that it needs to be available. So it needs to be part of the process and available. Um, this is a difficult thing to do from a scale standpoint. I, I recognize that. Uh, but it is uh, it is an important component because sitting with somebody else, it particularly helps with that acceptance element of helping someone get past their own interpretation, their own defenses, so they can really understand what is this feedback telling me in context 
uh, from someone who sees a lot of the data and get them into thinking about, okay, what, you know, in one hour, a good feedback coach should be able to get somebody from looking at their report to here are your top three development areas um, that they're invested in, by the way, not like here, I'm going to tell you what they are, but they're going to collaboratively uh, come to that understanding. And indeed, when we ask how many companies do allow this or provide this as an opportunity, it's been for 20 years, it's been pretty consistent that feedback coaching is a, is a, is a core component. In fact, it jumped up quite a bit this last year, I, this last study, I suspect probably because of the strain that leaders have been under, uh, you know, through the various um, uh, challenges and turmoil that we've had in the last few years. And so I suspect that there's a little bit more of an investment in making sure that they're getting an understanding of how they're doing and, and really from a retention standpoint, uh, very helpful. Again, doesn't have to be full on executive coaching at all, but a feedback coach. The other thing I would add in here, um, people often will want to do like a group feedback session. Um, it's pretty difficult to do what needs to be done in a group feedback session to get that acceptance part. I mean, that's the real purpose for doing this. In a group feedback session, you can talk about how to read the report. You can answer any questions about the technicalities in the report, but ideally your report is not so complicated that you can't understand it, right? It ought to be clear enough. These reports can be insanely complicated, but they don't have to be. They can be very simple and clear. And so I would emphasize that approach so that you really don't um, need to invest in a group session around how do I read this report that I don't understand. In that group session, you're going to have a very hard time giving people the individual attention they need to go through the resistance they have, to go through the defensiveness they have. Um, they're going to likely dismiss feedback. And in a group setting, it's just hard to kind of go through, frankly, what can be an emotional um, or even an intellectual like understanding um, exercise because you just need someone on the outside to kind of help you through your specific situation and understand the feedback. Um, but an hour is usually enough. So these are my top six. I'll just kind of review them quickly. Uh, again, be clear about your purpose. Uh, you know, that senior level support, nothing better. Um, uh, content is king in many ways. Don't overlook it. Super important. Great opportunity to influence the environment. Shorter, but not too short surveys. Don't, you know, make sure the mechanisms are in there for anonymity and communicate it and then and then include coaching. Um, so these are my my top six. I, a couple more slides on kind of what the future looks like. So we ask we ask folks like, hey, you know, what do you see your future uses and how do you see 360 feet, you know, fitting into what you're what you're doing uh, moving forward? And um, what I would say, you know, to quote a famous poet is the future is bright. Um, and so, uh, you know, what we're finding is that people really feel like they're going to continue or, or grow their feedback process and continue or invest more in, in the process. So the value seems to be there. We see it from the senior level support, um, but even from folks that are implementing this, that, that they're really seeing an opportunity to not just continue, but even grow the, the, the program that they're, that they're using. And hopefully by, by making adjustments and tweaks and, you know, making it better and better uh, each year. Okay, so those are my data. Those are my data points. Um, hopefully, I've been provocative in some places, and there may be some questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Jesse, who's going to tell me um, if I've got uh, some questions to go through. Hi, Dale. Yeah, we have a couple questions that people have written in during the webinar. Um, we have some time, so if you have a burning question, uh, feel free to type it in now. So the first one um, was sort of just asking about other methods of feedback. So is 360 feedback the best method available? And what are the advantages over other types? Yeah, so actually uh, chapter 25 in our uh, the handbook, uh, Strategic 360 Feedback, uh, was one I wrote on this topic. So thank you for the question. Um, there's a There are a number of other kind of feedback tools out there, sort of the nudges and the pulse surveys and things like that. Um, that have been tried um, there, you know, for a long time, there was the, there were these anytime feedback apps, and I think there are probably some still around, but what we've seen, and we've looked at a lot of case studies uh, across multiple different platforms, 
uh, and that where these uh, applications tend not to work particularly well, um, they tend to um, they tend to have some challenges in terms of uh, not giving um, people well not giving in depth enough feedback and then not giving um, varied enough feedback in terms of positive and negative. They tend to be um, uh, like my understanding actually of like GE did this, they had this, this program called PD. And when they looked at the data and they don't publicize this, but when they looked at the data, like 70% of the data or more was just, you know, attaboys kind of like, Oh, that was great. That was great. That was great. Likes kind of stuff, you know, and not really that substantive. And the other 30% wasn't very in-depth. So not very helpful from a development standpoint, not a bad thing from a, um, like a motivation. Like it's not bad to give people attaboys. That's great. But if you're a leader trying to improve or you just started in a new role or you're trying to dig in and figure out how do I elevate my game, not going to be very helpful. The other thing is that that a lot of these things like pulse surveys and stuff are trying to get you more feedback. And what we find is that people don't really need more feedback. They're busy. They're in their jobs. They're doing their thing. They don't need to constantly be redirected. What do I need to do? Do this, do this, do this, do that. They need like to create a consistent plan that they can work and develop over a stretch. So it's kind of like really take an in-depth look using a 360 at where you're at and what you can improve, create a plan, and then go work that plan and then reevaluate, create a new plan and work that plan. But like every other week getting feedback is, it's distracting. It's not very helpful. So um, I, we really feel like 360s kind of got that right balance. Again, not 150 questions, um, but really take it as a serious in-depth look at your development and then use that to, to plan forward. The other stuff that we've seen just does not seem to quite capture it. It sounds great, looks great, seems cool, doesn't necessarily achieve that goal from a development and behavior change standpoint. Okay, um, somebody wrote, what do you think about doing a second 360 and comparing the results to the first one? Yeah, so the test retest idea is popular, particularly on leadership programs where we're gonna, you know, give them a 360, we're gonna spend six months working with them in, you know, classes and give them supports and do lateral assignments, and then we're gonna test them at the end. And we've had a number of clients that have done this. And what we find is that often um, we had one client who who promised their executive sponsor that they would see score increases, and that was how they justified the program. And that one and multiple others saw their scores go down. And so uh, I would be very cautious of that. <laughs> there are ways to do it. And I've actually written a technical report. If you're interested on this topic, let me know and I can send it to you. But there's sort of seven very technical reasons why it doesn't work particularly well um, without some cautions in place. Some of them have to do, for example, with different raters. We know raters have different profiles in terms of how they rate. So if you end up with seven raters on the first survey and 12 on the second survey, and they're totally different people, it might be that you just had different people. So it's very difficult to, 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 to do that. And you can, but I would do it with caution. And feel free to ask me about the paper. I'm happy to send it to you. So Andy wrote in, um, when creating custom items for a client, are there strategies you use to test for reliability or validity before rolling out the survey to the organization? Um, so validity is covered pretty heavily in the way you develop the content from a, uh, so content validity, right? If you're working with a number of different um, leaders across the organization to get feedback and confirmation that these are the appropriate behaviors for leaders at this level of where we're and where we're headed strategically. Uh, that's generally content validity is what you're trying to achieve um, when you're building a 360. Long, complicated answer I won't get into on criterion validity, but um, that that is generally not recommended. Um, on a reliability standpoint, there's no real way to do that other than conceptually um, and then you can test afterwards, um, really in a, you know, standard sort of current box alpha assessment. Um, so you want to try to make the constructs, the, the competencies and the items hang together pretty well. You don't want to put like delegates effectively, admits mistakes and 
communicates confidently all in the same place. Those are kind of not conceptually the same thing. So they shouldn't be reliable, um, but you know, rather make sure that the content hangs together and then test the reliability afterwards uh, if the organization wants that. Um, but while you're writing it, reliability is pretty hard to check. Okay, so the next one is, um, you talked about content fit and customization. What are your thoughts about using off the shelf content? Yeah, off the shelf content can be great for the right application. You know, if you're if you're just trying, if you don't want to recreate the wheel, um, we've got one client that uses our off the shelf stuff that um, has so many different stakeholders that if he were to open it up to like, hey, let's build a custom tool, it would just be like this mashup of all these people with an opinion and what. And so, you know, in, in his case, he's like, you know what, it's better for me just to use the well-built tool that I know works and everyone can just kind of agree to it. So some of it has to do with internal dynamics um, uh, around that. Uh, Off-the-shelf tools also have the advantage that you can get like national norms. You can get local norms on an off on a custom tool, so that that can be really good. Um, uh, but mostly, I would say the off the shelf is is helpful in organizations where they're going to value that external expert kind of perspective, or if you're looking to do something you know kind of quicker, um, it take, can take time to build content and get it right and make sure it you know CEO gets involved. That takes a little while, uh, and then and then the other aspect I guess is um, you know, your, uh, volume, right? So if you're running a project with 20 leaders, might not be cost justified to take all the time, effort, money to build custom content. And if you got a hundred or more, you're going to repeat the process periodically. Yeah. Then probably it's, it's worth, it's worth doing. Uh, but it just depends on your, on your circumstance. And again, what you're trying to achieve, I've seen groups with as few as 30 customized content, but they were really using it as a way to, to drive a message around the, the the competencies and what we're expecting of leaders. And it was embedded in a bigger program, totally worth that. So, um, yeah. I had a question that I feel like ties back pretty well to sort of how you opened the webinar, but um, if retesting doesn't show improvement, how do we justify investing resources in the 360 process? Yeah. So I, I it reminds me of a, a leader I was working with in a, a large implementation where I asked him, I said, hey, you know, um, before we talk to you about re-upping and doing this the next year, you know, I'd love to do a survey of all the people that got feedback and see what they think of it and whether it's valuable or not. Leaders have a pretty good way of saying this was worth my time or this was some silly HR thing that was useless. And he said, that sounds like a waste of money. And I was like thinking he was talking about the 360. And I was like, uh, what do you mean? Like, you know, he goes, look, I got feedback. My direct reports got feedback. I've been in the middle of the process. I know how valuable it is because I know what it did for us. And so I guess what I would say is um, to the doubter, if you will, is get them to try it, like get them to step into it and realize where the value is. Um, if they don't see it just on the basis of the concept and the way it lays out and, you know, hey, there's probably information you don't know about your direct reports that could be helpful to you. If they don't see that there's value in that kind of anonymous feedback, if they don't see that there's value in sitting down, like just conceptually and sitting down and looking at how effective am I as a leader and what can I do better and making a plan, you know, try doing it. And they might find some insights about themselves that, you um, uh, again, uh, what I would say though is make sure they do get a feedback coach. If you just give them the desk drop and go, "Here's your report. It's super valuable," your 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 odds are a lot less. Um, yeah, uh, and then you know there's some studies that show you know that uh, that Kim et al. study is extremely rigorous. It's on top journal, you know. Um, so there's some there's some evidence out there that you could show in the abstract. Usually, people want it to be localized and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we want to know it worked here. Uh, but you can do those kind of surveys as well. That's the other thing I've seen done is, is you know, you ask leaders afterwards, very short survey on that one. Um, you'll get a low response rate anyway, but much lower if it's long. Just say, how, how valuable was this? What did you get out of it? You know, was it worth the time invested? And then you can message that up to say, hey, look, we gave this to 200 leaders. 80% of them said it was really worth their time. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, so... Uh, yeah, and then 
I mean, I, I could go on and on, but I, I guess I would say, you know, find out what, you know, what value they want from it. Because do they really want 360 scores to go up? Like, that's not really that compelling. Um, like, what what would value look like to them? Um, what would they like to see from a process like this? What would show them that it was, you know, making a difference for the business, not abstract scores going up? And then work a work a method around to to help them see that value and understand it. Yeah. Uh, so the next one, Dale, is uh, what prevents bias in feedback results? <laughs> Yeah, Walt Tornow wrote a great article in 1992, which now sounds like a long time ago, but sort of doesn't seem long to me. Um, <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. So um, I would not prevent bias. I would actually capture bias. I think what we're really trying to do is capture bias. I, you know, if you think back to the slide that I had with all the different points of view and the real angry guy and that other group, like what I'm trying to do is to capture what's going on. Is he biased or does he just have an opinion? Right. I'm trying to capture his point of view. So I want to understand those people's points of view and um, put it in context to, to be a better leader. Um, you know, what we find is if you're trying to prevent bias from like, a, hey, I'm using this to promote people and uh, I can't use a biased tool. I'm trying to get an objective evaluation of whether this person is a better leader than someone else and should therefore be promoted. Um, well, you're, you're, you're capturing multiple points of view and combining them. All of those points of view have a variety of different biases in them. Um, but you're doing, uh, you're using very specific behaviors, you know, so you're not, you're not saying, do you like this person or do you, or not? Should they be promoted? Should they not? Um, so you're forcing them into a very specific behavior, you know, rating process. And then again, you're capturing multiple views. So it's actually a, uh, if there is bias, it's at least balanced out across the organization. And, you know, the sense is if you've got 15 people who say that you're, you know, not listening effectively, are they biased or are they right? Seems like a lot of people. So um, I think trying to capture and understand that and then address it is really what we're trying to do. Okay, so I think um, we have one last one, sort of a nice one to end on. Um, Tamara asked, does 3D Group offer a 360 platform, coaching, or both? Yes, and yes, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, we we do um, custom 360s, as I talked about. We also have our Leadership Navigator suite of off-the-shelf tools, and then we have a, a cadre of, of coaches, and we'll typically, you know, design a program in such a way that the, you know, we'll, we'll implement the process. We've got project managers that implement, collect the data, generate reports, a dashboard for clients to be able to kind of see the process as it goes. And then our feedback coaches will get scheduled in to spend that one hour really getting them to what are the key takeaways here. And then there's all kinds of things you can go from there. You can aggregate up what all those key takeaways are to look at the whole system or just keep it focused on one leader. Um, but yeah, we've been doing it for 30 years and uh, we're pretty darn good at it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again for joining us today, everyone. If you'd like to talk about how feedback can support your talent goals, please reach out to us 510-463-0333 or visit our website. Thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining us.